For today's video, we're going to be interviewing one of my research mentors, Dr. Praveen Sethupathy, and just talk to him a little bit about some of the really cool research that goes on in his lab, how he got into science, as well as some advice for people who may be thinking about pursuing a career as a researcher. And I'm really excited about this because he's a brilliant communicator who always seems to find a way to effectively present very insightful and well thought out ideas. You know, Praveen is somebody who played a very large role preparing me for graduate school back at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He played a very large role helping me get into graduate school here at Cornell University. And he still plays a very large role in my training today to help me become a better researcher because that's the goal at the end of the day. You know, I just, I really can't sing him enough praises. You know, it's his kindness and his enthusiasm and his critical thinking that really just makes him a fantastic role model for me, not only as the type of researcher that I wanna be, but also as the type of person that I wanna be in the future as well. I really hope that you all get to enjoy hearing his responses in this interview, and hopefully you all get to see a little glimpse of kind of why I hold him in such high regard. And without further ado, Here's my interview with Dr. Praveen Sethupathy. Hope you enjoy. So first and foremost, thank you very much for joining me. I genuinely appreciate it. And of course, I hope that people who watch this will get a little bit of insight into you as a scientist, but also some of the cool work that goes on in your lab as well. Thanks for having me, John. It's your office. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, to start off, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to your current position as a faculty member here at Cornell. I was always, I think, a child that was intellectually curious. I think a lot of people can identify with that as a kid. You know, I think Neil deGrasse Tyson actually put it best when he said that kids are born scientists. Right? We're very curious about the world. Every day is new and we're always trying to investigate new things. And I grew up in a home that really fostered that curiosity, particularly in the areas of math and science, because my father was a math uh, professor and a computer science professor. And so I was trained to ask questions from a young age and I was trained to think critically critically from a young age. So I think I was primed, uh, even before I knew it, to be interested in intellectual pursuits. But then the question became, what would I explore? You know, what area would I really give more of my attention to? Growing up, I think English was actually my favorite subject. Um, I loved poetry, I used to write a lot of poetry, and I thought I might head in that direction, but there was a, a class that I took as a senior in high school as an AP Biology class. And I think the day that I realized that I had biology in my future, was when our high school teacher took us over to the local college where they had a cadaver set up. And we had, as uh, high school students, an opportunity to kind of poke around a human body. And while, you know, be somewhat squeamish about it, and it's a little bit weird, it was an unprecedented opportunity for, you know, a 16-year-old to start taking a look at what really was going on inside the body and how everything was actually connected and these abstract concepts of ligaments and tendons and the way that organs are situated. You really only know about these things in the abstract sense, what people tell you in a textbook, but to actually see it, to visualize it, to be able to touch it was a life-changing experience really. And it increased my sense of awe and mystery about the way the human body works. I think a lot of people can resonate with the awe that comes from looking up at the stars, right? And saying, wow, there's so much out there. How does it all work? And how did it all come to be? I think those are some unnatural questions. It's kind of similar to me as I started to learn more about the human body. How does it work, right? We expose our bodies to so many insults, to so many different changing environments, but we, for more or less, we just keep on ticking. How does that work? Right? How are our bodies robust to all of these constantly changing environments that we find ourselves in? But I think it's that basic question that really just enraptured me and got me interested. Now that you're at your current position at Cornell, what are some of the research questions that your lab investigates? You know, fundamentally, we're still interested in that same question that I started getting interested in as a kid. How do the cells of our body go about doing their business, even when they're faced with an onslaught of all sorts of different kinds of stimulations and changing environments? 
cells, right? In, in biology, we call this robustness. How do the cells maintain their functions in a constantly changing environment? It turns out that's rather complicated, but getting to the bottom of that is really important and exciting because it might give us a little bit of a window into what goes wrong when people start to develop different kinds of pathologies and diseases. So what is it about? What are the kind of fail-safe mechanisms that are in our cells that are maintaining that robustness and how are they getting broken when disease begins to develop. So fundamentally, that's what we're interested in. There are many disease areas that we do focus on and that we have funding to tackle in our lab. One main area is diabetes and metabolic disease. So this is a, a growing problem, not only here in America, but across the world. So it behooves us to pay attention to how different people across the world are being exposed either to dietary stimuli or lifestyle choices or different kinds of environmental exposures that are increasing their proclivity to develop diseases like diabetes, how that's influencing our genetics and our cellular behaviors, and how that's breaking those mechanisms that the cells have to maintain robustness of function over time. Another disease that we focus on in the lab is called Crohn's disease. This is another disease that is increasing in prevalence worldwide, particularly in developing nations. Um, and it's an inflammatory disease of the gut. And then cancer is another major research arm in the lab, in particular, a rare form of liver cancer that we've stumbled upon and have been studying the last four or five years. It's a particularly devastating disease because it affects children and young adults. And so the quality of life is very low. There are no treatment strategies right now, so it really pulls at the heartstrings in a unique way. Um, and so we've dedicated ourselves to studying that cancer. And then finally, colon cancer, which you yourself are involved in, that we've most recently started to study. That, of course, is much more common, but uh, despite the years, decades of studying it, we still don't have a cure. I mean, these are diseases, some of these anyway, that we've in the scientific community have been trying to tackle for decades and decades. Um, and we've made tremendous progress to the credit of so many other people and labs and creative thinkers and dedicated scientists. But despite all of that, sometimes it still feels like we're maybe not square one, but square two or three, right? There's still so much that we don't understand about these diseases. For example, we, in the last uh, decade or two, have really started to appreciate how heterogeneous these diseases are. So when we say someone has colon cancer, that may be quite different from another person's colon cancer. So appreciating that there are variations on the theme that are really important to pay attention to is a relatively recent thinking and uh, technologies have advanced to a point where we're now able to actually understand and tackle that. So it's a really exciting time to do science, but it is constantly humbling that every time we think we have peeled back a layer, understanding what might be causing some of these diseases, we realize that all we've really done is just ask 10 or 20 more questions. We've realized that the situation is even more complex than we could have previously fathomed. But progress is being made. We have to look at it sometimes with the big picture from the time that this kind of research began. And I think every time I do that, I'm amazed at what we've been able to do when we work together, the progress that we've been able to make, the treatments that we've been able to develop. So to be a small part of that, and, and I have to be clear, I feel that I'm a small part of that, right? This is a massive enterprise across the country and the world. So the more that we can do to work together, bringing together all sorts of different kinds of expertise and perspectives and angles, the better it'll be for the patients and maybe the faster we will get at uh, producing treatments that'll be effective. I know from personal experience, you put a lot of emphasis on effective science communication, not only in your own work and in your own presentations, but you also put a very large emphasis on it when training your graduate students. Yes. Uh, I just kind of wanted to get a better idea and hear from you uh, where this stems from and why you put such a large emphasis on it. I think it honestly Honestly, it stems from my um, early childhood and the training that I got from my father. He used to tell me all the time, you haven't understood something well enough until you can explain it to someone else. And I have really found that to be true over and over again in my life. It's somewhat straightforward to listen to someone explain something, have it make sense in your head and walk away thinking, yeah, I know what this is about. It's not until you force yourself to articulate it to someone else where you realize you might have gaps in your knowledge. So even from the standpoint of better understanding it yourself, 
It's a good practice to articulate what you are thinking inside your head to your colleagues and your peers around you. As you do that, you will find that you become more and more coherent uh, in your own thinking, and you will find that you actually do grasp and understand what you are studying better than you would have otherwise. So even from the standpoint of your own digestion of the material, it's a good practice. But then you realize very quickly as you practice that art that it has all sorts of other intangible benefits. The name of the game increasingly in the biological sciences is collaboration. No one person or one lab can really have expertise in all of those disciplines um, that are important for tackling important questions in biomedicine. So it is absolutely a requirement uh, to be able to draw in others to form collaborative units that can more effectively tackle the most pressing questions that we have. And if you don't know how to communicate your work effectively to your colleagues, then it'll be harder for you to be able to, to pitch them the idea of why they should get involved. Their time is just as valuable as yours. Why should they spend their time thinking about the questions that you are ardently trying to solve? And so you need to be able to communicate your work effectively, the value of it, why it will be mutually beneficial. The better that you're able to do that, the more effectively you can form these collaborative units and tackle the, the important question. The final thing that I might mention that I've become really passionate about and that I hope that my students will become passionate about as well is communicating with the lay public. It feels as though there is a growing chasm between scientists and those in our country and our world who are not as familiar with science and uh, you know maybe you start to feel as though there is an agenda an unspoken agenda among scientists and uh, vice versa there is this sort of somewhat uh, ivory tower feeling that you know those people that uh, aren't in science don't understand the value of what we do and I feel like there's a whole lot of complaining without trying to meet in the middle um, form bridges, walk across those bridges and talk with each other. And it's difficult to do that if we don't practice the art of communicating our work to people who may not be in our sphere, in our world on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, they're just as important as we are. And being able to communicate what we do so that they understand the value of it and how it impacts their lives uh, is a win-win. It helps them to see why what we're doing could be important. And it helps us um, to be able to practice communicating our work so that there can be a wider influence, not only within the scientific community, but in the lay public. Aside from science communication, what are some other skills that you find uh, essential to be a good and effective scientist? You know, there, there are some obvious ones, being able to digest information quickly, being able to juggle lots of different tasks. But I think I might highlight a couple that people don't think about as often. One is how important it is to be able to function within the context of a team. I alluded to this previously when I talked about the importance of collaboration. But even within a single lab, there are people with lots of different personalities, with different training backgrounds, different ways of doing some of the same things. And we're all you know, ideally working toward a common goal. And so we should be adaptable. So that's a really important feature. We should be able to have slack and give in the way that we work with one another, be able to compromise effectively so that the work that we're doing together is as efficient um, and as fun as possible. So adaptability, uh, being able to work well within a team, I think these are all really, really valuable skills for a scientist. You know, the idea of being a silo in science is increasingly going out of style. Um, and that's mostly because, you know, in order to tackle the most exciting questions, you need to work together in large groups, bring together lots of different ways of thinking. The, the second one that I would say is intellectual curiosity. There are a lot of really, really intelligent people out there, very bright people, but not all of them are really wired the same way. And we need smart people, uh, capable people in all of the different sectors of uh, work. But there are certain people that are wired for research, and it's not better or worse, but I find that those people that love uh, digging, they, they love the detective work, even in those times where the answers seem elusive. We all want answers, let's not kid ourselves. But in the research life, answers are few and far between. And as I mentioned previously, Often, really, more than answers, what we end up doing is telling one another, 
we really were asking the wrong questions, or there are really many, many more questions to tackle than we thought. But that process, there has to be something satisfying about that process for the research life to be fulfilling. Um, and so I think it's embracing this notion of constantly exploring and constantly doing detective work. There's something about that that has to be appealing for the research life to be satisfying at the end of the day. Last question. What advice would you give to somebody who wants to become a scientist in the biomedical sciences? I think the advice that I would give is very similar to um, what I mentioned previously, which is I find that the quality that is most important for a successful, happy research life right, is intellectual curiosity. It's uh, this desire to want to explore, right? And if you have that makeup, you have that mentality, you feel like you're wired that way, go for it. I wouldn't worry too much about what your grades were because there's value in being book smart. There's value in having learned how to manage your time well, to perform well in school and be good in your academics and be a strong performer. But that's not the best predictor of uh, who will be most successful in the research life. It really, I think, has more to do with that curiosity that's innate and, and also your grit. Right? Whether you have, over the course of your life, uh, developed a strong sense of perseverance and uh, stick to right, as they say, uh, the ability to be able to persevere through the peaks and the valleys that you'll experience as a researcher. A second piece of advice is how important it is to, early in your career and in your training, achieve a work-life balance. It's easy to put that off, and then by the time it becomes extremely critical for you to have cultivated good habits around work-life balance, it feels a bit too late because you just haven't worked on developing those. So I would advocate heartily for all people considering this avenue of work as early as you can. You know, have people around you that'll keep you accountable. Put boundaries in place so that you're not tempted to exceed those boundaries on a regular basis. Find ways in which to maintain your wholeness, as I say. We all love science, and I give a lot of time to scientific thought. But there's so many other things that are important to me. My family comes first, for example, and I hope to never compromise my family at the altar of uh, more success at science. That's not something that I really want to be doing. And so find, it, find out what are your boundaries and set those boundaries early and set practices in place that help you to be able to stay within those boundaries. I firmly believe that you can pursue excellence in this arena and not sell your soul to science. I think that that's, I, I hope to be an example of that for my students. So that's the other piece of advice I'd give. Well, that's all I have. Thank you very much for answering our questions and thank you very much for your time today. I genuinely appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to this video. Thanks for having me, John. Really appreciate it. Yep.